So welcome everyone uh, in the room here, and those of you that are watching on live stream or watching the recording later, uh, also welcome. I'm Van Riper. I run the GPOS program here at Google, which is mission is to uh, support communities of mindful living at every Google office. Uh, yes, it's a fun job. <laughs> uh, today uh, we have Lane Michelle Shell here, and um, he's going to introduce the research tools and concrete practices that increase well-being, mental clarity, performance and emotional stability when our heart and mind work better together. As a coach and consultant, he has helped many people and companies reach deep into their truth to make positive, sustained changes. Lane is the founder of Vera Heart, living his heart adventure as an engineer, executive, entrepreneur, inspirational guide, writer, and heart math certified trainer. Please join me in welcoming Lane Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Uh, really an honor to be with you guys and uh, be connected and uh, helping out with the GPOS group as well, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, when I started Vera Heart uh, a couple of years ago, it was really with the idea that um, this was the time to advance mindfulness and, and what I was calling heartfulness in uh, business, but in our personal lives as well. And that led to um, building or searching for best materials for empowerment, for supporting choice, and for supporting being um, more in our own energy, uh, and extending that to organizations so that organizations could become energized. And Vera Hart's uh, uh, tagline is about developing energized people and companies. Uh, this whole idea of opening up the energy that we have uh, unleashing new potential is a very exciting time right now. Uh, the part I want to share with you in this uh, uh, segment is about uh, human energy, our system, uh, and how uh, some biofeedback tools, the research and science behind those is helping to improve how we can access more of our energy, build more of our energy, and, uh, and frankly achieve more as well, both personally and as organizations come together using these practices as a team. Uh, so that's what we're going to uh, focus on uh, uh, those elements today. Um, first of all, uh, so <laughs> hashtags. Uh, I go out and uh, search for anything to do with energy and people. Uh, and what do you imagine that I find? It's uh, oil, petroleum, it's uh, solar, it's, you know, the idea of we as a, as a human energy system is just about non-existent still out in all the social media. Uh, so let's launch it. Let's get it going. So hashtag human energy. We're going to start drawing all this stuff together, everything GPOS is about. We're going we're to pull together the ideas that we are energy systems. And I'm going to touch on uh, a couple of important aspects uh, with us as human energy systems related to this topic of being able to move with mindfulness and heartfulness and increase our energy. Necessarily, we've got to touch on emotions. You go, ugh, emotions, uh, uh, I, I don't want to go there. Uh, and the reality is that uh, I speak from experience, not wanting to be there, having been an engineer, and I, I had a great career with Hewlett Packard, went into consulting. Um, you can imagine high tech and then management consulting, there's not a lot that you do with emotions in there. In fact, if anything, keep it out of the way, don't go there. Uh, and the reality is that uh, along the process, I've learned the role of emotions, I've learned um, how those relate to energy systems, so I'm going to share some important points with that too. And then we're going to get into uh, what science research has shown as really what we believe is the most valuable tool for being able to uh, manage your energy system, manage intelligent, intelligently manage your energy, direct it, and be able to build more. So we're going to touch on heart rate variability. That is the key metric, the key uh, biofeedback determinant, and we're going to demonstrate uh, heart rate variability used to be able to raise energy and uh, deliver coherence and resilience. Now, those may not be different words than you've heard, they won't, but how they're used and how they're going to be used is we all go forward and managing our human energy is very, very important. So I'm going to uh, help define those, and then we're going to put those into practice as well. So human energy. Um, let's start with the idea that, first of all, um, we are energy systems. Now, there, there certainly is 
uh, human power, which is our kinetic abilities. We can move things. We, we move. Um, there is our metabolism and our, the energy in our system, the power that we uh, have in our system itself. There's, uh, you know, we actually develop, uh, uh, produce electricity. <laughs> There's actually interesting science going on right now, um, a la matrix, that maybe we could be our own battery. A little scary where that might go, having, you know, Matrix as the movie still prevalent in everybody's uh, minds. But the pr we do produce electricity, maybe only four watts, but, you know, maybe there's a way to harness more of that. And the reality, and what we think of as um, the energy and the power um, that we typically understand that we have, um, it's depleted, it's used, it's, you know, inefficient. We, we have more heat in the... Uh, production of energy uh, that is heat loss and so loss of energy. Most of the time when we talk to people about uh, human energy, it's about the loss and the inefficiency of our system uh, in losing energy. And uh, the reality is that we're going to turn that upside down here uh, because what um, we have to recognize is that as humans, we expend and renew energy all day long. Uh, and uh, in that process, uh, two um, important aspects um, are, that you may not know about that science has covered. One is that um, we have uh, the ability to produce energy uh, from our heart. And we have a heart field, an electromagnetic field of our heart. That's, this is a, a computer-generated model representing the heart field that has been measured with magnetometers. Um, that heart field uh, extends three feet out from your body. So what I want you to do is just reach your arms out. Go, go ahead. Intrude on your neighbors. Okay. Now, that's a little bit less than your heart field that's generating right now. Uh, how is that as everybody's arms were over each other? Well, the reality is all of your heart fields are intermingling as well, and we're going to come back to that point. The, the, your heart, as an electrical device, as your heart beats, it is creating an electromagnetic field. And that is this three-foot field. And there are other devices that measure it much, much wider as well. But let's stick with that, where the science is behind this magnetic field, this electromagnetic field that we have of the heart. Um, and the idea that your heart continues to beat in producing that field. And we're not talking about auras or um, more esoteric or, or Eastern belief in mess. We're talking about real, measurable uh, electromagnetic field that you have, we all have, as long as we're alive. Um, the other thing is that think about your, this energy that's being produced in this electromagnetic field that you have. It's a carrier wave. It is a carrier of um, what you are experiencing through your heart. And uh, what I'm telling you is that your intentions, thoughts, and your emotions are carried as messages in your electromagnetic field. What do I mean by that? Have you walked into a room and felt kind of dread or like, this is icky, or not this meeting again? Well, that could be other reasons, but <laughs> you know, have you had that experience where you just don't want to be in that spot? Well, what's happening is you, you as a sensor in this electromagnetic field, you are receiving information but you're also transmitting information uh, as well. Um, if you have been in a place where it was feeling down like that and somebody walks in and they shift the energy in the room, or you walk into a room and the energy feels very different and you're lifted, what's happened there? It is this whole interchange of this electromagnetic field, the heart fields that is at play here. It's a real and tangible sense that you have. It's a tool you have as well. It's part of your human energy. Um, and uh, science calls that, by the way, a coherent field effect that is real and measurable. Um, the more that we all synchronize, and we're going to do some, some work, the more, the more we all synchronize and our heart fields become coherent, that coherent field effect creates that environment that is a positive and uplifting environment. A lot of mindfulness practice and the meditation or the breathing, the, the work of mindfulness itself is even feeding, it is feeding this coherent field effect. 
Um, so we're going to build on that as well. So electromagnetic field three feet from you. The other thing with uh, human energy to touch on is that um, I mentioned you're, you're a battery. You really are. We're all batteries. Uh, what do batteries do? They charge and discharge. Uh, in the case of the battery, what we're talking about here is renewing and depleting uh, all day long. So what are some of the things that we are renewing with? Well, the biggest one we're supposed to renew is and regenerate is with sleep. Our sleep cycle is the biggest regenerator that we have of our human energy. Uh, if we're not getting sleep and we sustain sleeplessness, you never get ahead of having enough energy and you get towards the end of the day and you just don't have enough left, right? So another generator though is the practices that we can do that uh, through our heart and through our psychophysiology are able to produce and lift energy, to draw more energy in as a part of our human energy system. Uh, and so um, that, uh, that kind of work is facilitated through the devices that we're going to demonstrate today. The practices that we can do that uh, allow us to um, harness breath as the number one tool for being able to produce our energy. So as, uh, as a battery, uh, think about these two questions. Each day, each day, right now, you can think about how are you charging your battery? Are you getting enough sleep? Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> right? uh, are you having broken sleep? If we start with sleep and sleeplessness, sleepless disorders are a big reason for um, our uh, discharge and our inability to bring up that battery, uh, bring up our, our human energy and our potential. Um, are you doing things that allow you to take a break? Are you getting into nature? Are you finding the ways that you're able to charge your battery? There's a, um, something that we're going to talk about here about appreciation and compassion and care. Um, accessing that it turns out to be a big lift of energy as well. Uh, what about depleting or draining? What's going on that depletes or drains your battery? If you, if you allow the first two or three thoughts to come in, I would pretty much guess that something emotional is in that list. Something's happened that is draining your, your battery. Um, but the, it can come from any of four domains. Uh, it can come from the physical domain. Maybe you just really exhausted your body. You did a major workout but didn't allow yourself the time to rebuild. Uh, maybe you've uh, got accumulated uh, things that are going on in your physiology that don't allow you to efficiently, at, in your systems, be able to generate more, uh, more energy. Uh, the emotional domain over there turns out to be the most important in terms of being able to uh, build energy or stop the discharge or, or release of energy. Mentally, um, this is something we all in high tech have got a real challenge. We are continually processing. I tell people all the time, I have an A, B, C, and a D processor, and, and the C and D never stop, for sure. I try to hold the A processor in the front, which is problem solving all the time, but the reality is all four are working in that hyper mental state. Uh, I, I could be exhausting my energy uh, in that place. And then even in terms of spiritually, or, are we um, operating within some place that is in our values? I go to a lot of places where we're going to work on the culture of the company and the people's values and the values of the company don't match. And in this domain over here, people feel exhausted just walking in the door. And so you can look at all four of these domains for how you're charging and how you are uh, depleting your energy. Which brings us over to emotions. Now, Here's something. Heart-mind connection. Um, let's explore that just a little bit. Emotions are key to energy. I've said that before. Uh, there's something that, uh, that happens that when you experience an emotion, either, either depleting or renewing, depleting emotion might be anger, frustration, uh, anxiety, 
when you experience one of those negative emotions or depleting emotions, it launches a 1400 biochemical and hormonal set of changes in your body that have as much as a 12 hour tail to them. Now think about that, that cascade of biochemical and hormonal reactions is um, real, it's measurable, um, and it has uh, a, an effect on both your psyche and your physiology both. It, it sustains for a long period of time as well. Uh, in the, the renewing side, so happiness aspects, uh, uh, joy, uh, appreciation, they also, by the way, have a, an equivalent 1400 biochemical and hormonal cascade effect in your body that also can have a 12 hour tail. What's going on on the, the depleting side is the release of, in particular, cortisol and all the effects that cortisol, that, uh, that uh, kind of drug that uh, in our system that just takes us down and hard to get out of a cycle. Or on the renewing side is the release of DHEA. And DHEA is that, that joy, joy kind of hormone. It's the one that we want to feel. It's bliss. Um, the reality is that we're always trying, our bodies are trying to, as human energy systems, trying to balance those. Um, and it's through our autonomic nervous system that that balancing effect is going on continuously all day long through the sympathetic hitting the gas and the parasympathetic hitting the brake part of our system. We're wired to have this continual back and forth to be able to balance our system and balance our, our body. Our heart sits right in the middle of that whole process. Our heart is where emotions are being encoded and uh, affecting our energy and what we do all day long. That autonomic nervous system regulates about 90% of your energy and the functions that relate to that. So it's breathing, heartbeat, digestion, immune, hormonal uh, responses, they're all affected in this on our autonomic ner nervous system. So the emotions part gets very interesting because with our emotions, um, did you know you have 40,000 neurons in your heart? How many people knew that? Okay, a few. It's, it, it is, uh, and just to be complete, by the way, you have 86 billion in your brain and you have about 100 million in your gut. And those are all interconnected. Now, the 40,000 neurons in your heart, very interesting. Um, these have been known about for a long time, but only, only it was about 20 years ago began to be explored more. Um, and the organization that Vera Hart is aligned with, the Institute of Heart Math, is the leading researchers and practitioners. A lot of what we're covering here and the devices that come that we're going to use are from Institute of Heart Math, where they've explored those what's going on with the heart mind connection, uh, what's going on with these neurons. For instance, here's a, a little known fact, but very important. There's a cluster of these neurons that uh, in your heart that when you hold a feeling of appreciation, care, or compassion for just about 10 seconds, you hold that, you feel it in your heart, that sends a message to the, your uh, frontal cortex, to your brain, and it launches a very specific uh, uh, hormonal and biochemical set of changes in your body that carry joy and carry appreciation, carry it throughout your system. You're in control of that through being able to hold that kind of attention with appreciation, care, or compassion. Again, researched, proven, peer-reviewed, published research that is out there that's talking about this heart-mind connection with emotions. Um, our, our emotions um, are really uh, centered through communication with the heart to the brain and through the channel of the brain, the medulla and the amygdala, and then up into or the cortex. The reality is when you measure the communications that are happening through the vagus nerve, through this connection here, the heart is communicating way more with the brain than the brain with the heart. Let's say that again. The heart is continually communicating more with the brain than the brain with the heart. A significant disparity in that. The heart is trying to send messages all the time. The heart is sending those same messages in the electromagnetic field. And the, the, 
by being able to do spectral analysis of our electromagnetic, your heart field, science now, researchers can predict with 75% accuracy what emotions you're experiencing. That's pretty phenomenal to be 75% accurate with, with using spectral analysis of your electromagnetic field on emotions. Your emotions are centered around this heart-mind connection. And that's what's taken Vera Heart, my company, and us into focusing more on, so what really is going on with the heart and these communications that are, are continually happening, what the heart is signaling. There's um, other uh, research that uh, has really astounded me. Um, what researchers love to do is to hook up people to computers, of course, right? Brain activity, you know, heart monitoring, skin conductance, so on. And in this particular study that was a very significant breakthrough done with Institute of Heart Math, um, they would serve up either a horrific image or a beautiful, joyful image, randomly selected by the computer. And the participants that went through that study, had, they had control, they had the clicker to decide when the image would come up. Um, Peer-reviewed study itself, and here's what the astounding thing for me. Before the computer randomly selected whichever image, the heart knew with a greater accuracy whether it was the horrific or the beautiful, and sent a message to the brain. That's before the image was selected by the computer. And then, you know, the, the image comes, sensory, we get the visual sense, the brain then gets the message, and then sends a whole lot of messages out through the body. What is going on there? That is a, that is a huge, huge piece of science that is just now being dug into deeper. Our heart knows something more. Our heart is sensing things in this field. Our heart is connected to our brain, trying to help our brain be prepared for what we are going to experience. Be prepared for lifting our energy. Remember, the heart is connected to our autonomic nervous system, obviously, and it is sending signals through the system, causing this release of chemical and hormonal changes in our body. Your heart is way more active in what is going on with your energy than you're aware. And this, this now is, um, the good news is, that we have the ability to um, manage that intelligently manage. And that's where we get into heart rate variability. So heart rate variability you know, gives us a measurable window, gives us the tool. Um, and what it is simply is when we look at the um, amount of time between heartbeats and then we compare those, that's heart rate variability. It's a simple measure. Now I, I love simple models and simple measures. Maybe it's because I can't figure out the complex ones, or maybe I'm just too tired of complexity. <laughs> but this is simple. Um, it also is um, very quickly um, becoming much, much more a reliable predictor of many, many different things in healthcare and, and, uh, and the um, healthcare research fields. That's fundamentally what heart rate variability is um, all about. Um, as the heart is sending messages to the brain, What's happening is that uh, the variance between heartbeats is shifting. That's a part of emotions, thoughts coming back. This is continual interchange and adjustment in our systems to try to find balance. Or to, if the heart's sensing something to get ready to react to, then what happens? Heart beats faster, right? Variability you know, shifts to be able to, and reflecting this increase in, a, a decrease in the amount of time in between, but the increased heart rate. Um, and just the opposite occurs as well. So emotions are uh, changing our physiology. We talked about that. Well, depleting uh, emotions create an, um, an incoherent heart rhythm, a, more, a greater degree of shifts in the variability of heart rhythm. Uh, and um, renewing emotions, those that lift our energy, create a more harmonious or coherent pattern uh, in the shifts of our heart rate variability. And the physiology too, by the way, is you breathe in, th that um, increases your heartbeat, and as you exhale, 
you get a decrease. That's one effect of increase and decreasing, but not the total effect. Uh, so what we, uh, what we have is a tool uh, to be able to uh, look at heart rate variability. Now what I want to do is demonstrate you know, heart rate variability in action. So I need a volunteer, someone who wants to come up and uh, you know, experience the biofeedback device that we have. Okay, come on up. You raised your hat. <laughs> it's like an auction, you know. I, you had an auction paddle that you lifted up. Thanks for coming up. Oh, did I miss someone? Okay, we'll we'll make time. Yeah, right there is good. All right, I'm gonna, just gonna hook that right up to your uh, earlobe there. Now, what uh, what we're actually using is a, um, a dual biofeedback tool and a piece of software from Institute of Heart Math. Uh, it's called M-Wave. This is the M-Wave Pro version um, so that you can all uh, see it and, and we can demonstrate what's going on with it. The sensor is an optical sensor. It's actually detecting pulse. Uh, what's your name? Chris. Chris. It's uh, detecting Chris's pulse um, and uh, you see, uh, Chris won't see because Chris can't turn around, but it's, it's uh, showing us that uh, there's a good read, so we've got good data. Uh, this is reliable data to be able to look at how this device can provide feedback or, or measure heart rate variability. So, so as this device is working, what it's doing is it's just literally um, trying to um, help encode. It helps encode this variability. So those beat-to-beat -beat changes that are happening. Um, and as Chris is experiencing, you know, standing here with all of you staring at Chris, who obviously loves this, um, it, you know, it's like his body is reacting, his heart is reacting. To, are you reacting, you think? Probably. You don't look like you're reacting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the, on the surface, you look kind of calm there, Chris. Um, so so it, let me tell you about these devices. Um, first of all, there's, um, this is the M-Wave Pro. There's actually a, a device which is uh, M-Wave 2. This is a standalone device that does the exact same kind of measures. You, you get software very close to this that you load onto your system, Mac or Windows. And um, you can take this anywhere. And what it does is help. It's an entrainment device, a biofeedback device. It helps you to find a natural way of being able to um, have the kind of heart rate variability that's going to build coherence and resilience. Now I'm going to start using those terms as we go forward. Uh, so um, with these tools, oh sorry, I want to look. There's also um, another device. There's an app. Um, the current app is uh, iOS. Why do they always start with iOS instead of Droid? I mean, come on, let's create a shift here. The, the Droid version comes out at the end of the year, I'm told. Um, fundamentally, this, uh, this app, um, this is the iOS version, um, has uh, the ability to do the same thing as that standalone device, uh, entrainment, biofeedback, um, being able to use heart rate variability. Okay, so um, we're all going to uh, get a chance to use the most fundamental part of um, of improving heart rate variability, and, and this is called heart-focused breathing. Um, and so we'll, I invite you all to, to do this with Chris and myself. Okay, so um, in your seat, find, find just a comfortable position in your seat. Are you comfortable, Chris? Mm -hmm. Okay. You've looked comfortable all along, but not really. I, <laughs> I have data proving otherwise. Okay. Um, so in that comfortable place, pay um, attention to your heart now you want to, you can put your heart, hand over your heart. Begin breathing through your heart or your chest area. Breathe a little deeper and slower than normal. Five seconds in and five seconds out. Again, five seconds in and five seconds out. Five seconds in, and five seconds out. Continue that breathing, and as you're breathing a little slower and deeper than usual, 
just allow your mind to give you a feeling of appreciation, care, compassion for someone or something. Whatever comes in, allow it to come in and just hold that in your heart as you're breathing. Continue the five seconds in and five seconds out. We'll do one more cycle. Five seconds in and five seconds out. Okay. So I'll stop the data recording. Chris, thank you. Um, we're going to let you go. <laughs> this way you get to see your data too. Okay, well, first of all, Chris, you're going to live. Okay, that's the <laughs> good news. Uh, uh, all kidding aside, turns out that heart rate variability um, is one of the emerging best predictors of all-cause mortality. Um, that is a very fancy way of saying uh, if you want to know if you're building longevity um, or not, this is a good indicator of that. In fact, heart rate variability is now, um, through the research being done, is able to predict someone's age within about four years. Um, and that is because that what happens is we're younger, um, we have greater variability, greater amplitude in this wave, and it reduces over years. Uh, and so, given no other changes, science can predict your age within about four years. Um, but the good news is you can fool science <laughs> by working with these kinds of tools. So here's what happened. We hooked up Chris. Uh, Chris is actually, uh, I Chris, are you in the GPOS group? Okay, so you might have been using some of that, or you might just have all the benefits of GPAWS already going. That's not too bad of a, you know, kind of a, a range of rhythm that's going on here. Right here is where we started heart, the uh, heart-focused breathing. And what do you notice about the change in there? Um, I look at it and say, well, first of all, there's a more even kind of uh, wave that's going on. There's greater amplitude, and it's clustered, you know, together as well. And you have about a about a 15 point spread over here. Uh, what what you want to have is um, something that looks kind of like a sine wave. Um, that get, that's showing a level of coherence in heart rate variability. And then the more amplitude, that's um, indicating more resilience. That's indicating more uh, youth. <laughs> is one way people like it described. Okay. Um, we had, uh, let's have we done time wise. I think we're doing okay to bring up uh, one more. You, did you want to come up? Now that you've seen it? <laughs> come on. Why not? we got time. What does the red uh, indicate? That's, uh, that is a uh, drop of data. Um, and then uh, the pickup of data indicates that uh, it's still a, a, a coherent, uh, not a coherent, a, a valuable set of data. What's your name? Tiffany. Tiffany. Welcome, Tiffany. Or I should have asked. Okay, to hook you up there. <laughs> it is. It is now. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, just get uh, Tiffany started out. Now, Tiffany has a little advantage in that um, Chris uh, kind of uh, was the real guinea pig and didn't have the benefit of all the other uh, uh, pieces that we went through. Um, so you have a little bit more responsibility to generate a sine wave. No pressure, Tiffany, at all. Um, have, you, have you been up in front of groups before? Yes. Oh, see, you know, this is like uh, interesting. How y so you're kind of in an even place. You don't feel stressed or anything. Not particularly. <laughs> more, what and more. <laughs> more and more. The more I talk. <laughs> OK. Uh, so what we're going to do is, as a group, we're going to do the heart-focused breathing again. Okay, and uh, we'll step into that. Um, go ahead and pay attention to the area of your heart. You can put your hand over your heart if you want to, feeling your chest rise and fall. Begin breathing through your heart or your chest area, just a little slower and deeper than usual. Five seconds in and five seconds out is a very good pattern.
five seconds out, breathe in and out, and five seconds in. Five seconds out. As you're continuing this five seconds in and out rhythm, allow your mind to give you a feeling of appreciation, care, compassion for someone or something. Hold that in your heart. Continue breathing. We'll do one more cycle of five seconds in, five seconds out. Great. Now come come back to center in your chair, eyes open. Oh, let me show you off here first. Wouldn't want you to get a shock. No, there's no <laughs> shock. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay, so um, we can look at uh, Tiffany's data. I could adjust the scale, but don't need to. We started out, and uh, she was pretty practiced already, and it was coming, but this was kind of just sitting in the chair for, uh, you know, l just about a minute. And then we started the heart focus breathing and you very quickly went right into a uh, sinus rhythm, uh, just a very nice sine wave and, and flow. You have uh, an amplitude, this, uh, we could pull up the data, but it won't be much below here of somewhere around 10 to 15, you know, points. Uh, so Chris had you a little bit beat there in resilience. Um, not that there has to be a competition, but you have a new goal. Okay, well, uh, thank you for both for being our uh, guinea pigs and demonstrating the tool. This, this data that comes from the tool is the same uh, data that uh, you use in the devices that I showed you, um, and it allows you to um, be able to train yourself and get the benefits of uh, what's happening uh, with heart rate variability. So, in, in recap, this is actually the same the same kind of process, somebody sitting up in, in, a, in a chair, um, and at the point the data ends here, come around here, they begin heart-focused breathing, and that, that additional part that I added in, which is called a heart lock-in in Institute of Heart Math terms. Um, what's happening in this top scale, what was for Chris and a little bit for Tiffany, is um, a more erratic, more incoherent type of pattern in the, in the biofeedback tool. And that's indicating that um, that jerky pattern is indicating that the autotomic nervous, their autotomic nervous system is doing a lot of adjustments between the release of cortisol or DHEA, the messages that uh, with emotions experience may be you know, sitting in front of an audience, it might be a phone call that you're on or a phone call you have to make, um, anything that could, or you know, an in-law, you know, something would um, uh, cause you to have this kind of uh, iteratic pattern. Why is Danielle laughing? <laughs> we'll talk later. Uh, so this erratic, erratic pattern here um, impairs performance. In fact, it greatly impairs performance. Um, it is uh, a huge indicator of uh, confusion, uh, of depleting energy in particular that we talked about before. Um, it's an indicator of uh, even impaired judgment, lack, uh, communication won't be as clear. A whole lot of factors have been tested, measured, and, and um, they indicate um, a lot of times why teams have problems in working together too. As opposed to establishing this kind of more sine wave uh, pattern where you can reach optimal performance. And the thing that uh, Vera Hart we're doing right now is we're teaming up with uh, uh, some our coaches and consultants teaming up with um, others to begin working with companies, teams and companies, to shift them out of there into this and uh, measure the difference in achievement in terms of what their goals are. And also, happiness at work, being able to be more fulfilled at work, express their values and so on, a lot of different factors. Um, so that's what we're doing um, with heart rate variability, with our uh, People, this is the devices that I held up and shared. They're available through Vera Hart or directly from Institute of Heart Math. 
Um, they run um, 129 to 199 are the prices. They're very affordable devices. These devices have been out. Um, the M wave has been over 10 years and been, it's gone through a, a generation of change. The, the um, iOS version of this inner balance and the Droid versions coming out are newer, uh, but they fundamentally are using the same proven, tested algorithms, same kind of um, tools to be able to continue uh, to build more coherence and resilience. So let's talk about those now, because I've been hinting around to them for a little bit. Coherence. Uh, full disclosure, that's my sine wave up there. That's my r run from about a week ago. Uh, I'm trying to get um, more uh, resilience, but coherence, that's looking pretty good. I'm uh, now um, also in full disclosure, six months ago when I began working, it didn't look like that at all. <laughs> it looked like that frustration kind of uh, occurred, very mental kind of, uh, very uh, even emotional, I have to admit, emotional type of effects that, that were there. But now I'm able to jump into that kind of coherent place. Well, what is coherence? It is defined as that optimal state in which heart, mind, and emotions are aligned and in sync. Um, in effect, through the autotomic nervous system, through the messages from the heart to the brain, and then the, the effects that come from that, there's greater synchronization, um, and the heart and emotions much more involved in that process. Um, our immune hormonal nervous systems function in this energetic coordination. Okay, that's the definition of coherence. What it means is that we are more efficiently and more intelligently managing our human energy. So this is the magic coherence, is our ability to manage human energy. And it's represented in that sine wave look, as opposed to the jagged, you know, ir incoherent type of rhythm, okay? Then there's resilience. Resilience, um, now with this knowledge of heart rate variability, um, the tools that you can use as well, uh, resilience is the ability to build your capacity for human energy, holding, um, re regenerating, and then using your human energy. I'll say that again. Resilience is the ability to build your capacity for human energy. Um, so it's per to prepare for, recover from, and adapt in the face of stress, challenge, adversity. The resilience is that measure that when you're about to go into something that's going to be stressful, don't just walk right in. You take just a pause. Just a few seconds even can make a big difference, but a few minutes can make a whole world of difference. You, you can visualize going into a resilient pattern, moving from this erratic anticipation of what's going to happen. Anticipation and emotions means you're releasing a flood of chemicals that are depleting you before you even go into your situation. You activate the heart-mind connection, become more resilient, more coherent as well, and you're going to be better prepared for whatever you're going into. So heart rate variability then, um, it is uh, to providing all these, I'll let you read those benefits, but fundamentally these come out of published peer-reviewed research. Uh, if you go to Google Scholar and look at HeartMath is the lead research group for 20 years in heart-mind connection. Um, the number of citations from other groups in them is, is huge. There are 263 published pieces of work from Institute of HeartMath that are heavily cited. These are results out of a lot of these published works, the science that's been conducted behind and the practices that have come out of um, Institute of HeartMath and the work we do to extend those practices uh, to be able to share with you and, and with others. Um, there's uh, a paper, uh, Roland McCarty is the, the uh, uh, head of research for Institute of HeartMath. He has a fantastic uh, paper that summarizes this and uh, that I've talked about, but a whole lot more. Um, and it's uh, consistent heart-based um, positive emotion techniques that, uh, that they're looking at um, show uh, greater self-management, your ability to manage your energy system, and um, better regulation of your physiology even. So that's uh, in my book, that means that we become more resilient, more healthy, 
more um, uh, able to harness and, and access our energy at a, a shorter amount of time. Uh, so that paper is called Heart Brain Neurodynamics. Uh, was published in 2015, uh, so recently done uh, published piece. And if you go to Google Scholar under Heart Math, you'll find that uh, published there. What it really comes down to, heart rate variability, if you just take five to ten minutes, uh, five times a week, practicing that same breathing that I just shared with you, you will have the effect of moving into more coherence and more resilience. It's even that little bit makes a huge, huge shift. Now extend it. If you start your day, so what I did was, um, as I began working with these tools, and I've been heavily working with them for about a year, and, and then six months ago, I shifted my whole morning. Now, my morning was this. I got up, what I do? <laughs> my uh, phone, and began looking at the news, my email, um, social media, you know, got a company to run. I need to know what the pulse is in the morning, right? So at 6 a.m., I'm already feeding myself with, um, admittedly, you know, a whole stream of negative news, um, a whole bit of bunch of challenges that come in on email, and maybe, and some good things too, but now I'm being rocked both ways. Uh, and I realized that that wasn't very mindful, and it certainly wasn't heartful. I shifted my entire routine. Now when the first half hour starts, okay, I'm big admission here, yoga. <laughs> Right? Yoga is my way of life now. I mean, I, I really have found the benefits of yoga. Uh, that yoga that starts out for five minutes, I go into my own mantra, my own meditation work, the, use this same tool here with the HeartMath tool, and in 30 minutes, I've uh, either established or reestablished that coherent rhythm and greater resilience. When I've reached that level, I'm ready to get my day going. I'm a completely different person, and that six months of work um, wasn't even, I mean, it was a month of establishing new habits and then maintaining that for another month, and it is just my habit. You could do that. It has a huge effect um, and a huge impact, but you can start, and it, so that's the heart math part of this, 10 minutes of my morning, and I do that seven days a week. That's how I got that curve, by the way. Data run. Okay, so um, where mindfulness meets heartful. Uh, the, I've I mentioned a couple times pause. Um, with Vera Hart, one of the things we're, we've, we've threatened to start a movement of pause for choice. I think we're going to do it. We'll get, we got the domain name. What, what, you heard it here right now. Pauseforchoice.com. We'll get it live within a week or two. Uh, the whole idea is this. Um, I'm convinced if this world inserted a pause, before speaking or acting uh, and in any way, and that pause can be a few seconds to a few minutes, we'd have a completely different world. It allows us to have the heart send a message to the brain to wake up, become more aware, mindfulness, to pull ourselves in our center, and full awareness, full attention and intention, and then we go about whatever we have to deal with. That golden pause shifts everything. We teach that to everybody we work with. First thing and foremost, pause. And the pause begins with even just one breath. It allows you to access so much more wisdom, so much more of your energy, your human energy. Hashtag human energy. Re seriously, folks, within two weeks, I want that hashtag like climbing way up because it's nowhere right now. <laughs> I, had to, I had our team launch like a a uh, bunch of uh, hashtag human energies today because I wanted to use it here and it's nowhere. Uh, so if it goes somewhere, thank you. You all did it. And it will. Um, so pause, number one. Appreciate. So when I, uh, I mentioned act, let your mind serve up a feeling of appreciation, care, or compassion, um, that is um, accessing this appreciation second step. Now here's the key. Um, it, if you can radiate that, and so I use radiate, three feet, electromagnetic field, right? You've got that appreciation, care, compassion, radiate it. <laughs> Send it in your field. Let it go more than three feet. What the heck? Have a, joy, have a joyful time with it. That is mindfulness meeting heartfulness. Third, listen. You have so much intuition, intelligence, and wisdom 
that you have access to. And, and those who are in mindfulness practices know that. They access more. Now bring the heart in more uh, with some of these tools as well. And, and even you go deeper. And your senses begin to expand. We live a lot of life desensitized. There's so much coming at us all the time. Let's reopen our senses and do that in a way that allows us to be heartful. Fourth is to connect. Um, and a good way to think in this electromagnetic field is um, the uh, uh, heart math has a great way. They say, what are you putting in the field today? <laughs> you know, so are you generating positive thoughts? Are you generating things that help other? Are you putting love in the field? Are you, are you experiencing thoughts of love or are you expressing love? Is that coming out in your field? Care, compassion, things that uplift people. You have the responsibility for your electromagnetic field. What are you going to put in it? What are you transmitting? And fourth um, is solutions. It's, we are, listen, it's about results. It's about achievement. We are in a world that respects achievement and results, and it should. Um, we're not doing this just for, you know, joy and kicks. We're doing this because we've got um, a world that's going so fast and accelerating more. Moore's Law is not going to stop. I don't care how many people have predicted over how many decades. It doesn't stop. It won't stop. It's going to keep going. We're going to have things continue to accelerate, not just with technology and information, but in the area of this new space, this, our senses, our ability to sense more, our ability to be more in touch with others through our field. Um, and so solutions can come in, the, in personal health, but also in smarter decisions and more results that uh, get more done. So heart-focused breathing, um, remember that when we do uh, training, we, that is the base tool, uh, the one that I shared with you. You can continue using that um, and expand on it with the appreciation, but that is the most fundamental tool and it creates the pause. So recapping, um, I kind of like this. Uh, scientific research, has uh, finally collided with, uh, you can call it spiritual practices. Greg Braden actually uh, kind of um, created that kind of uh, idea that we've brought these two together, and, and he's right. Uh, our brain was believed to be the master organ, and it's not the master organ. It's part of a system, a distributed system that masters who we are. Our heart drives our hashtag human energy. Uh, and that recognition of the role of emotions as a key determinant of your energy, depleting or renewing, once you have that in consciousness, you're already going to start increasing your human energy, increasing your personal energy. The heart field is present, it's real, it's measurable. You're transmitting and receiving all day long. And uh, our human energy uh, capacity can grow. We can be more resilient. We can be more coherent. We are in control of being able to increase that. Uh, published research that's out there, you can, I encourage you to go look into heartmath.org. Uh, go to Google Scholar, look at the citations here. Um, this this peer-reviewed work is fundamentally starting to um, take hold and launch and move forward. So thank you very much. It, I, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Okay. You can you can make up a question. <laughs> I'm I'm curious about this uh, heart field. Um, I know that electric fields don't stop at a particular place. You talk three feet. What is what is what is the heart field? Is it a is it the electromagnetic field coming out of the is it electromagnetic field coming out of the uh, neurons? From, uh, I'm sorry. What 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 is yeah, generating it? What what are the, what are, what do you see in it when you actually measure it? I understand what you're measuring with, with the the pulse on the ear, but right. I don't understand what you well, mean by the heart what, field. Uh, it's a magnetometer in this case. Uh, in hospitals, I believe squibs are used. But what, what's happening is your, your uh, heart, the, re the way it pumps is through electrical signals, uh, you know, to, you know, pump and, uh, you know, have that rhythm that it's got. 
Um, anything that's uh, uh, electrical uh, on and off creates a magnetic field. And so what you really are generating is the signals of, for your heart um, are creating that magnetic field itself. That uh, Think of it, it's not really on off, but that's the way I, I communicate sometimes that, you know, boom, 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 boom. That creates a measurable electronic field. Now, the other thing that's interesting is your brain has electrical activity too. Uh, anybody have any idea how, uh, how big the electro electromagnetic field of the brain is? One to two inches. That's an astounding difference in power, the you know, energy that's going on. So that is, that is a, a real measurable um, electromagnetic field from that uh, pulse that creates your heartbeat. Okay. Did that answer your question all the way? I understand how there is electromagnetic field created whenever you have a, an alternated current in something. And I, I've, in a previous job, I worked with people who were as, using squid technology, mm -hmm. superconducting something or others, to measure brain uh, magnetodynamics or something of the brain. I, what I don't quite understand is, or another thing I'm a little uncertain about is how you say that different people's heart fields interact. What is the receiving part of that? I understand how it's generated. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by receiving? Yeah, um, well the, the receiving um, side, the way, only way I can answer that, I'm not a neuroscience, neuro, actually I have neurocardiologists now who do this work. Um, they're measuring the receiving side of others' emotions or other fields as they interact. And so that can create a, a coherent field effect that's measurable that um, there's a, an increase in a particular um, uh, coherence of uh, heart rhythms. So here's, here's an example of measure. Um, four people, three of which do that heart-focused breathing. They've learned the techniques to get a coherent rhythm. The fourth person, no experience, no, not even told. They're blind to what's going on. Um, all get together, they're just in, in the, at the table together, all four hooked up. Uh, uh, somewhere, some number of minutes, I think it was six minutes, and I don't remember exactly, but some amount of time, the data run, the three are cued to start doing heart-focused breathing, same thing you did. They establish coherent field with a very short amount, very, very short amount of time, the fourth person goes into coherence as well. And they're not doing any breathing. They're not doing any of these, they don't know the techniques, they're unconscious to it. They're receiving from the others. And that's the best I can, I can answer in terms of the science that's going on behind it. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question? One more question? Or not? Oh, well, if you're, oh. One there? So, I've never believed in people being being able to see people's auras, but then now that you've been saying that, do you think it's possible that people can see others' auras? Well, the, that's a question completely different from what I was addressing, yeah. but uh, the answer is yes, I do believe. And I think there's other things that are uh, going on. There's other intuitive senses, other tools that we have that are, they're not part of what I was covering, but yes, I do believe that is the case, and I, I think that's going to, that's a whole area that's opening up more, uh, which is just fascinating, because when we talk about the bigger topic of energy, I mean, listen, we're, the whole, we're, we're all just energy. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, you know, matter is just the placement of the potential of energy at any time. We know that from quantum side, so yeah, I believe, I believe a lot more is going to be discovered. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we could have a lot of good fun with that. So unfortunately, we have to wrap up uh, today's talk, but Lane is uh, staying here for lunch. We're going to be going to Big Table, so if anyone has a question they were too shy to bring up here, they could uh, bring it to lunch with us. So thank you for coming out, everyone. And thank you, Lane. Thank you so much. <laughs>